Chapter One of the Science of Being Great. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Moylinger. The Science of Being Great by Wallace D. Wattles. Chapter One: Any Person May Become Great. There is a principle of power in every person. By the intelligent use and direction of this principle. Man can develop his own mental faculties. Man has an inherent power by which he may grow in whatsoever direction he pleases, and there does not appear to be any limit to the possibilities of his growth. No man has yet become so great in any faculty, but that it is possible for someone else to become greater. The possibility is in the original substance from which man is made. Genius is omniscient flowing into man. Genius is more than talent. Talent may merely be one faculty developed out of proportion to other faculties, but genius is the union of man and God in the acts of the soul. Great men are always greater than their deeds. They are in connection with a reserve of the power that is without limit. We do not know where the boundary of the mental powers of man is. We do not even know that there is a boundary. The power of conscious growth is not given to the lower animals. It is man's alone, and may be developed and increased by him. The lower animals can, to a great extent, be trained and developed by man. But man can train and develop himself. He alone has this power, and he has it to an apparently unlimited extent. The purpose of life for man is growth, just as the purpose of life for trees and plants is growth. Trees and plants grow automatically and along fixed lines man can grow as he will trees and plants can only develop certain possibilities and characteristics man can develop any power which is or has been shown by any person anywhere nothing that is possible in spirit is impossible in flesh and blood nothing that man can think is impossible in action nothing that man can imagine is impossible of realization man is formed for growth and he is under the necessity of growing it is essential to his happiness that he should continuously advance. Life without progress becomes unendurable, and the person who ceases from growth must either become imbecile or insane. The greater and more harmonious and well-rounded his growth, the happier man will be. There is no possibility in any man that is not in every man. But if they proceed naturally, not two men will grow into the same thing or be alike. Every man comes into the world with a predisposition to grow along certain lines, and growth is easier for him along those lines than in any other way. This is a wise provision, for it gives endless variety. It is as if a gardener should throw all his bulbs into one basket. To the superficial observer they would look alike, but growth reveals the tremendous difference. So of men and women, they are like a basket of bulbs. One may be a rose, and add brightness and color to some dark corner of the world. One may be a lily, and teach a lesson of love and purity to every eye that sees. One may be a climbing vine, and hide the rugged outlines of some dark rock. One may be a great oak among those boughs the birds shall nest and sing, and beneath whose shade the flocks shall rest at noon, but every one will be something worthwhile, something rare, something perfect. There are undreamed of possibilities in the common lives all around us in a large sense. There are no common people. In times of national stress and peril, the cracker box loafer of the corner store and the village drunkard become heroes and statesmen through the quickening of principle of power within them. There is a genius in every man and woman, waiting to be brought forth. Every village has its great man or woman, someone to whom all go for advice in time of trouble someone who is instinctively recognized as being great in wisdom and insight to such a one the minds of the whole community turn in times of local crisis he is tacitly recognized as being great he does small things in a great way he could do great things as well if he did but undertake them so can any man so can you the principle of power gives us just what we ask of it if we only undertake little things, it only gives us power for little things. But if we try to do great things in a great way, it gives us all the power there is. But beware of undertaking great things in a small way. Of that we shall speak farther on. 
there are two mental attitudes a man may take one makes him like a football it has resilience and reacts strongly when force is applied to it but it originates nothing it never acts of itself there is no power within it men of this type are controlled by circumstances and environment their destinies are decided by things external to themselves the principle of power within them is never really active at all they never speak or act from within the other attitude makes man like a flowing spring power comes out from the centre of him he has within him a well of water springing up into everlasting life he radiates force highest felt by his environment the principle of power in him is in constant action he is self-active he hath life in himself no greater good can come to any man or woman than to become self-active all the experiences of life are designed by providence to force men and women into self-activity to compel them to cease being creatures of circumstances and master their environment in his lowest stage man is the child of chance and circumstance and the slave of fear his acts are all reactions resulting from the impingement upon him of forces in his environment he acts only as he is acted upon he originates nothing but the lowest savage has within him a principle of power sufficient to master all that he fears and if he learns this and becomes self-active he becomes as one of the gods the awakening of the principle of power in man is the real conversion the passing from death to life it is when the dead hear the voice of the son of man and come forth and live it is the resurrection and the life when it is awakened man becomes a son of the highest and all power is given to him in heaven and on earth nothing was ever in any man that is not in you no man ever made more spiritual or mental power than you can attain or did greater things than you can accomplish you can become what you want to be end of chapter one Chapter Two of the Science of Being Great by Wallace D. Wattles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Heredity and Opportunity. You are not barred from attaining greatness by heredity. No matter who or what your ancestors may have been, or how unlearned or lowly their station, the upward way is open for you. There is no such thing as inheriting a fixed mental position. No matter how small the mental capital we receive from our parents, it may be increased. No man is born incapable of growth. Heredity counts for something. We are born with subconscious mental tendencies, as for instance, a tendency to melancholy or cowardice, or to ill temper. But all these subconscious tendencies may be overcome. When the real man awakens and comes forth, he can throw them off very easily nothing of this kind need keep you down if you have inherited undesirable mental tendencies you can eliminate them and put desirable tendencies in their places an inherited mental trait is a habit of thought of your father or mother impressed upon your subconscious mind you can substitute the opposite impression by forming the opposite habit of thought you can substitute a habit of cheerfulness for a tendency to despondency you can overcome cowardice or ill-temper. Heredity may count for something, too, in an inherited conformation of the skull. There is something in phrenology, if not as much as its exponents claim. It is true that the different faculties are localized in the brain, and that the power of a faculty depends upon the number of active brain cells in its area. A faculty whose brain area is large is likely to act with more power than one whose cranial section is small. Hence, persons with certain conformations of the skull show talent as musicians, orators, mechanics, and so on. It has been argued from this that a man's cranial formation must, to a great extent, decide his station in life, but this is an error. It has been found that a small brain section, with many fine and active cells, gives as powerful expression to faculty as a larger brain with coarser cells and it has been found that by turning the principle of power into any section of the brain with the will and purpose to develop a particular talent the brain cells may be multiplied indefinitely 
any faculty power or talent you possess no matter how small or rudimentary may be increased you can multiply the brain cells in this particular area until it acts as powerfully as you wish it is true that you can act most easily through those faculties that are now most largely developed you can do with the least effort the things which come naturally but it is also true that if you make the necessary effort you can develop any talent you can do what you desire to do and become what you want to be when you fix upon some ideal and proceed as here and after directed all the power of your being is turned into the faculties required in the realization of that ideal more blood and nerve force go to the corresponding sections of the brain and the cells are quickened increased and multiplied in number the proper use of the mind of man will build a brain capable of doing what the mind wants to do the brain does not make the man the man makes the brain your place in life is not fixed by heredity nor are you condemned to the lower levels by circumstances or lack of opportunity the principle of power in man is sufficient for all the requirements of his soul no possible combination of circumstances can keep him down if he makes his personal attitude right and determines to rise the power which formed man and purposed him for growth also controls the circumstances of society industry and government and this power is never divided against itself the power which is in you is in the things around you and when you begin to move forward the things will arrange themselves for your advantage as described in later chapters of this book man was formed for growth and all things external were designed to promote his growth no sooner does a man awaken his soul and enter on the advancing way than he finds that not only is god for him but nature society and his fellow men are for him also and all things work together for his good if he obeys the law poverty is no bar to greatness for poverty can always be removed martin luther as a child sang in the streets for bread linnaeus the naturalist had only forty dollars with which to educate himself he mended his own shoes and often had to beg meals from his friends hugh miller apprenticed to a stonemason began to study geology in a quarry george stevenson inventor of the locomotive engine and one of the greatest of civil engineers was a coal miner working in a mine when he awakened and began to think james watt was a sickly child and was not strong enough to be sent to school abraham lincoln was a poor boy in each of these cases we see a principle of power in the man that lifts him above all opposition and adversity there is a principle of power in you if you use it and apply it in a certain way you can overcome all heredity and master all circumstances and conditions and become a great and powerful personality end of chapter two chapter three of the science of being great by wallace d wattles this librivox recording is in the public domain the source of power man's brain body mind faculties and talents are the mere instruments he uses in demonstrating greatness in themselves they do not make him great a man may have a large brain and a good mind strong faculties and brilliant talents yet he is not a great man unless he uses all these in a great way that quality which enables man to use his abilities in a great way makes him great and to that quality we give the name of wisdom wisdom is the essential basis of greatness wisdom is the power to perceive the best ends to aim at and the best means for reaching those ends it is the power to perceive the right thing to do the man who is wise enough to know the right thing to do who is good enough to wish to do only the right thing and who is able and strong enough to do the right thing is a truly great man he will instantly become marked as a personality of power in any community and man will delight to do him honor wisdom is depended upon knowledge where there is complete ignorance there can be no wisdom no knowledge of the right thing to do man's knowledge is comparatively limited and so his wisdom must be small unless he can connect his mind with knowledge greater than his own 
and draw from it by inspiration the wisdom that his own limitations deny him this he can do this is what the really great men and women have done man's knowledge is limited and uncertain therefore he cannot have wisdom in himself only god knows all truth therefore only god can have real wisdom or the right thing to do at all times and man can receive wisdom from god i proceed to give an illustration abraham lincoln had limited education but he had the power to perceive truth in lincoln we see pre-eminently apparent the fact that real wisdom consists in knowing the right thing to do at all times and under all circumstances in having the will to do the right thing and in having talent and ability enough to be competent and able to do the right thing back in the days of the abolition agitation and during the compromise period when all other men were more or less confused as to what was right and as to what ought to be done lincoln was never uncertain he saw through the superficial arguments of the pro-slavery men he saw also the impracticability and fanatism of the abolitionists he saw the right ends to aim at and he saw the best means to attain those ends it was because men recognized that he perceived truth and knew the right thing to do that they made him president any man who develops the power to perceive truth and who can show that he always knows the right thing to do and that he can be trusted to do the right thing will be honored and advanced the whole world is looking eagerly for such men when lincoln became president he was surrounded by a multitude of so-called able advisers hardly any two of whom were agreed at times they were all opposed to his policies at times almost the whole north was opposed to what he proposed to do but he saw the truth when others were misled by appearances his judgment was seldom or never wrong he was at once the ablest statesman and the best soldier of the period where did he a comparatively unlearned man get this wisdom it was not due to some peculiar formation of his skull or to some fineness of texture of his brain it was not due to some physical characteristics it was not even a quality of mind due to superior reasoning power processes of reason do not often reach knowledge of truth it was due to a spiritual insight he perceived truth but where did he perceive it and whence did the perception come we see something similar in washington whose faith and courage due to his perception of truth held the colonies together during the long and often apparently hopeless struggle of the revolution we see something of the same thing in the phenomenal genius of napoleon who always knew in military matters the best means to adopt we see that the greatness of napoleon was in nature rather than in napoleon and we discover back of washington and lincoln something greater than either washington or lincoln we see the same thing in all great men and women they perceive truth but truth cannot be perceived until it exists and there can be no truth until there is a mind to perceive it truth does not exist apart from mind washington and lincoln were in touch and communication with a mind that knew all knowledge and contained all truth the same is true for all who manifest wisdom wisdom is obtained by reading the mind of god End of chapter 3、Chapter、4 The Mind of God There is a cosmic intelligence that is in all things and through all things. This is the one real substance. From it all things proceed. It is intelligent substance or mind stuff. It is God. Where there is no substance, there can be no intelligence. For where there is no substance, there is nothing. Where there is thought, there must be a substance which thinks. Thought cannot be a function, for function is motion, and it is unconceivable that mere motion should think. Thought cannot be vibration, for vibration is motion, and that motion should be intelligent is not thinkable. Motion is nothing but the moving of substance. If there be intelligence shown, it must be in the substance and not in the motion. Thought cannot be the result of motions in the brain. If thought is in the brain, it must be in the brain's substance and not in the motions which brain substance makes. 
but thought is not in the brain substance for brain substance without life is quite unintelligent and dead thought is in the life principle that animates the brain in the spirit substance which is the real man the brain does not think the man thinks and expresses his thought through the brain there is a spirit substance that thinks just as the spirit substance of man permeates his body and thinks and knows in the body so the original spirit substance god permeates all nature and thinks and knows in nature nature is as intelligent as man and knows more than man nature knows all things the all mind has been in touch with all things from the beginning and it contains all knowledge man's experience covers a few things and these things man knows but god's experience covers all the things that have happened since the creation from the wreck of a planet or the passing of a comet to the fall of a sparrow all that is and all that has been are present in the intelligence that is wrapped about us and enfolds us and presses upon us from every side all the encyclopedias man have written are but trivial affairs compared to the vast knowledge held by the mind in which men live move and have their being the truth men perceive by inspiration are thoughts held in this mind if they were not thoughts man could not perceive them for they would have no existence and they could not exist as thoughts unless there is a mind for them to exist in and the mind can be nothing else than a substance which thinks man is thinking substance a portion of the cosmic substance but man is limited while the cosmic intelligence from which he sprang which jesus calls the father is unlimited all intelligence power and force comes from the father jesus recognized this and stated it very plainly over and over again he ascribed all his wisdom and power to his unity with the father and to his perceiving the thoughts of god my father and i are one this was the foundation of his knowledge and power he showed the people the necessity of becoming spiritually awakened of hearing his voice and becoming like him he compared the unthinking man who is the prey and sport of circumstances to the dead man in a tomb and besought him to hear and come forth god is spirit he said be born again become spiritually awake and you may see his kingdom hear my voice see what i am and what i do and come forth and live the words i speak are spirit and life accept them and they will cause a well of water to spring up within you then you will have life within yourself i do what i see the father do he said meaning that he read the thoughts of god the father shows all things to the son if any man has the will to do the will of god he shall know truth my teaching is not my own but his that sent me you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free the spirit shall guide you into all truth we are immersed in mind and that mind contains all knowledge and all truth it is seeking to give us this knowledge for our father delights to give good gifts to his children the prophets and seers and great men and women past and present were made great by what they received from god not by what they were taught by man this limitless reservoir of wisdom and power is open to you you can draw upon it as you will according to your needs you can make yourself what you desire to be you can do what you wish to do you can have what you want to accomplish this you must learn to become one with the father so that you may perceive truth so that you may have wisdom and know the right ends to seek and the right means to use to attain those ends and so that you may secure power and ability to use the means in closing this chapter resolve that you will now lay aside all else and concentrate upon the attainment of conscious unity with god oh when i am safe in my sylvan home i tread on the pride of greece and rome and when i am stretched beneath the pines where the evening star so wholly shines i laugh at the lore and pride of man at the sophist schools and the learned clan for what are they in all their high conceit when men in the bush with god may meet End of chapter 4
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Preparation Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. If you become like God, you can read His thoughts. And if you do not, you will find the inspirational perception of truth impossible. You can never become a great man or woman until you have overcome anxiety, worry, and fear. It is impossible for an anxious man, a worried one, or a fearful one to perceive truth. All things are distorted and thrown out of their proper relations by such mental states, and those who are in them cannot read the thoughts of God. If you are poor, or if you are anxious about business or financial matters, you are recommended to study carefully the first volume of this series, The Science of Getting Rich. That will present to you a solution for your problems of this nature, no matter how large or how complicated they may seem to be. There is not the least cause for worry about financial affairs. Every person who wills to do so may rise above want, have all he needs, and become rich. The same source upon which you propose to draw for mental unfolding and spiritual power is at your service for the supply of all your material wants. Study this truth until it is fixed in your thoughts and until anxiety is banished from your mind. Enter the certain way which leads to material riches. Again, if you are anxious or worried about your health, realize it is possible for you to attain perfect health so that you may have strength sufficient for all that you wish to do and more. That intelligence that stands ready to give you wealth and mental and spiritual power will rejoice to give you health also. Perfect health is yours for the asking, if you will only obey the simple laws of life and live aright. Conquer ill health and cast out fear. But it is not enough to rise above financial and physical anxiety and worry. You must rise above moral evil-doing as well. Sound your inner consciousness now for the motives that actuate you and make sure they are right. You must cast out lust and cease to be ruled by appetite, and you must begin to govern appetite. You must eat only to satisfy hunger, never for gluttonous pleasure, and in all things you must make the flesh obey the spirit. You must lay aside greed, have no unworthy motive in your desire to become rich and powerful. It is legitimate and right to desire riches, if you want them for the sake of the soul, but not if you desire them for the lusts of the flesh. Cast out pride and vanity. Have no thought of trying to rule over others, or of outdoing them. This is a vital point. There is no temptation so insidious as the selfish desire to rule over others. Nothing so appeals to the average man or woman as to sit in the uppermost places at feasts, to be respectfully saluted in the marketplace, and to be called rabbi, master. To exercise some sort of control over others is the secret motive of every selfish person. The struggle for power over others is the battle of the competitive world, and you must rise above that world and its motives and aspirations and seek only for life. Cast out envy. You can have all that you want, and you need not envy any man what he has. Above all things, see to it that you do not hold malice or enmity toward any one. To do so cuts you off from the mind whose treasures you seek to make your own. He that loves not his brother loves not God. Lay aside all narrow personal ambition, and determine to seek the highest good, and to be swayed by no unworthy selfishness. Go where all the foregoing, and set these moral temptations out of your heart one by one, determined to keep them out. Then resolve that you will not only abandon all evil thought, but that you will forsake all deeds, habits, and courses of action, which do not recommend themselves to your noblest ideals. This is supremely important. Make this resolution with all the power of your soul, and you are ready for the next step towards greatness, which is explained in the following chapter. End of chapter 5「6. Of the Science of Being Great » by Wallace D. Wattles This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Social Point of View Without faith, it is impossible to please God, and without faith, it is impossible for you to become great. The distinguishing characteristics of all really great men and women is an unwavering faith. 
We see this in Lincoln during the dark days of the war. We see it in Washington at Valley Forge. We see it in Livingstone, the crippled missionary, threading the mazes of the dark continent, his soul aflame with the determination to let in the light upon the accursed slave trade which his soul abhorred. We see it in Luther and in Francis Willard, in every man and woman who has attained a place on the muster roll of the great ones of the world. Faith, not a faith in oneself or in one's own powers, but faith in principle, in the something great which upholds right, and which may be relied upon to give us the victory in due time. Without this faith, it is not possible for anyone to rise to real greatness. The man who has no faith in principle will always be a small man. Whether you have this faith or not depends upon your point of view. You must learn to see the world as being produced by evolution, as a something that is evolving and becoming, not as a finished work. Millions of years ago, God worked with very low and crude forms of life, low and crude, yet each perfect after its kind. Higher and more complex organisms, animal and vegetable, appeared through the successive ages. The earth passed through stage after stage in its unfolding, each stage perfect in itself, and to be succeeded by a higher one. What I wish you to note is that the so-called lower organisms are as perfect after their kind as the higher ones, that the world in the Eocene period was perfect for that period. It was perfect, but God's work was not finished. This is true of the world today. Physically, socially, and industrially, it is all good, and it is all perfect. It is not complete anywhere or in any part, but so far as the handiwork of God has gone, it is perfect. This must be your point of view, that the world and all it contains is perfect, though not completed. All's right with the world. That is the great fact. There is nothing wrong with anything. There is nothing wrong with anybody. All the facts of life you must contemplate from this standpoint. There is nothing wrong with nature. Nature is a great advancing presence, working beneficently for the happiness of all. All things in nature are good. She has no evil. She is not completed. For creation is still unfinished, but she is going on to give to man even more bountifully than she has given to him in the past. Nature is a partial expression of God, and God is love. She is perfect, but not complete. So it is of human society and government. But though there are trusts and combinations of capital and strikes and lockouts and so on, all these things are part of the forward movement. They are incidental to the evolutionary process of completing society. When it is complete, there will be harmony. But it cannot be completed without them. J. P. Morgan is as necessary to the coming social order as the strange animals of the age of reptiles were to the life of the succeeding period, and just as these animals were perfect after their kind, so Morgan is perfect after his kind. Behold, it is all very good. See government and industry as being perfect now, and as advancing rapidly toward being complete. Then you will understand that there is nothing to fear, no cause for anxiety, nothing to worry about. Never complain of any of these things. They are perfect. This is the very best possible word for the stage of development man has reached. This will sound like rank folly to many, perhaps to most people. What? they will say. Are not child labor and the exploitation of men and women in filthy and unsanitary factories evil things? Aren't saloons evil? Do you mean to say that we shall accept all these and call them good? Child labor and similar things are no more evil than the way of living and the habits and practices of the cave-dweller were evil. His ways were those of the savage stage of man's growth, and for that stage they were perfect. Our industrial practices are those of the savage stage of industrial development, and they are also perfect. Nothing better is possible until we cease to be mental savages in industry and business, and become men and women. This can only come about by the rise of the whole race to a higher viewpoint. And this can only come about by the rise of such individuals here and there 
as are ready for the higher viewpoint the cure for all this inharmoniousness lies not with the masters or employers but with the workers themselves whenever they reach a higher viewpoint whenever they shall desire to do so they can establish complete brotherhood and harmony in industry they have the numbers and the power they are getting now what they desire whenever they desire more in the way of a higher purer more harmonious life they will receive more true they want more now but they only want more of the things that make for animal enjoyment and so industry remains in the savage brutal animal stage when the workers begin to rise to the mental plane of living and ask for more of the things that make for the life of the mind and soul industry will at once be raised above the plane of savagery and brutality but it is perfect now upon its plane behold in fact it is all very good so it is true of saloons and dens of vice if the majority of the people desire these things it is right and necessary that they should have them when the majority desires a world without such discords they will create such a world so long as men and women are on the plane of bestial thought so long the social order will be in part disorder and will show bestial manifestations the people make society what it is and as the people rise above the bestial thought society will rise above the beastly in its manifestations but a society which thinks in a bestial way must have saloons and dives it is perfect after its kind as the world was in the eocene period and very good all this does not prevent you from working for better things you can work to complete an unfinished society instead of to renovate a decaying one and you can work with a better heart and a more hopeful spirit it will make an immense difference with your faith and spirit whether you look upon civilization as a good thing that is becoming better or as a bad and evil thing that is decaying one viewpoint gives you an advancing and expanding mind and the other gives you a descending and decreasing mind one viewpoint will make you grow greater and the other will inevitably cause you to grow smaller one will enable you to work for the eternal things to do large works in a great way toward the completing of all that is incomplete and inharmonious and the other will make you a mere patchwork reformer working almost without hope to save a few lost souls from what you will grow to consider a lost and doomed world so you see it makes a vast difference to you this matter of the social viewpoint all's right with the world nothing can possibly be wrong but my personal attitude and i will make that right i will see the facts of nature and all the events circumstances and conditions of society politics government and industry from the highest viewpoint it is all perfect though incomplete it is all the handiwork of god behold it is all very good End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Science of Being Great by Wallace D. Wattles This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Individual Point of View Important as the matter of your point of view for the facts of social life is, it is of less moment than your viewpoint for your fellow men, for your acquaintances, friends, relatives, your immediate family, and most of all, yourself. You must learn not to look upon the world as a lost and decaying thing, but as a something perfect and glorious, which is going on to a most beautiful completeness. And you must learn to see men and women not as lost and accursed things, but as perfect beings advancing to become complete. There are no bad or evil people. An engine, which is on the rails pulling a heavy train, is perfect after its kind and it is good. The power of steam, which drives it, is good. Let a broken rail throw the engine into the ditch, and it does not become bad or evil by being so displaced. It is a perfectly good engine, but off the track. The power of steam that drives it into the ditch and wrecks it is not evil, but a perfectly good power. So that which is misplaced, or applied in an incomplete or partial way, is not evil. There are no evil people, there are perfectly good people who are off the track, but they do not need condemnation or punishment. They only need to get upon the rails again. That which is undeveloped or incomplete often appears to us as evil, 
because of the way we have trained ourselves to think the root of a bulb that shall produce a white lily is an unsightly thing one might look upon it with disgust but how foolish we should be to condemn the bulb for its appearance when we know the lily is within it the root is perfect after its kind it is a perfect but incomplete lily and so we must learn to look upon every man and woman no matter how unlovely in outward manifestation they are perfect in their stage of being and they are becoming complete behold it is all very good once we come into a comprehension of this fact and arrive at this point of view we lose all desire to find fault with people to judge them criticize them or condemn them we no longer work as those who are saving lost souls but as those who are among the angels working out the completion of a glorious heaven we are born of the spirit and we see the kingdom of god we no longer see man as trees walking but our vision is complete we have nothing but good words to say it is all good a great and glorious humanity coming to completeness and in our association with man this puts us into an expansive and enlarging attitude of mind we see them as great beings and we begin to deal with them and their affairs in a great way but if we fall to the other point of view and see a lost and degenerate race we shrink into the contracting mind and our dealings with men and their affairs will be in a small and contracted way remember to hold steadily to this point of view if you do you cannot fail to begin at once to deal with your acquaintances and neighbors and with your own family as a great personality deals with men this same viewpoint must be the one from which you regard yourself you must always see yourself as a great advancing soul learn to say there is that in me of which i am made which knows no imperfection weakness or sickness the world is incomplete but god in my own consciousness is both perfect and complete nothing can be wrong but my own personal attitude and my own personal attitude can be wrong only when i disobey that which is within i am a perfect manifestation of god so far as i have gone and i will press on to be complete i will trust and not be afraid when you are able to say this understandingly you will have lost all fear and you will be far advanced upon the road to the development of a great and powerful personality end of chapter 7、Chapter、eight Consecration Having attained to the viewpoint that puts you into the right relations with the world and with your fellow men, the next step is consecration. And consecration in its true sense simply means obedience to the soul. You have that within you, that which is always impelling you toward the upward and advancing way. And that impelling something is the divine principle of power. You must obey it without question. No one will deny the statement that if you are to be great, the greatness must be a manifestation of something within. Nor can you question that this something must be the very greatest and highest that is within. It is not the mind, or the intellect, or the reason. You cannot be great if you go no farther back for principle than to your reasoning power. Reason knows neither principle nor morality. Your reason is like a lawyer, in that it will argue for either side. The intellect of a thief. Will plan robbery and murder as readily as the intellect of a saint will plan a great philanthropy. Intellect helps us to see the best means and manner of doing the right thing, but intellect never shows us the right thing. Intellect and reason serve the selfish man for his selfish ends as readily as they serve the unselfish man for his unselfish ends. Use intellect and reason without regard to principle, and you may become known as a very able person. But you will never become known as a person whose life shows the power of real greatness. There is too much training of the intellect and reasoning powers, and too little training in obedience to the soul. This is the only thing that can be wrong with your personal attitude, when it fails to be one of obedience to the principle of power. By going back to your own center, you can always find the pure idea of right for every relationship. To be great and to have power. It is only necessary to confirm your life to the pure idea as you find it in the great within. 
every compromise on this point is made at the expense of a loss of power this you must remember there are many ideas in your mind that you have outgrown and which from force of habit you still permit to dictate the actions of your life cease all this abandon everything you have outgrown there are many ignoble customs social and other which you still follow although you know they tend to dwarf and belittle you and keep you acting in a small way rise above all this i do not say that you should absolutely disregard conventionalities or the commonly accepted standards of right and wrong you cannot do this but you can deliver your soul from most of the narrow restrictions that bind the majority of your fellow men do not give your time and strength to the support of the obsolete institutions religious or otherwise do not be bound by creeds in which you do not believe be free you have perhaps formed some sensual habits of mind or body abandon them you still indulge in distrustful fears that things will go wrong or that people will betray you or mistreat you get above all of them you still act selfishly in many ways and on many occasions cease to do so abandon all these and in place of them put the best actions you can form a conception of in your mind if you desire to advance and you are not doing so remember that it can be only because your thought is better than your practice you must do as well as you think let your thoughts be ruled by principle and then live up to your thoughts let your attitude in business in politics in neighborhood affairs and in your own home be the expression of the best thoughts you can think let your manner toward all men and women great and small and especially to your own family circle always be the most kindly gracious and courteous you can picture in your imagination remember your viewpoint you are a god in the company of gods and must conduct yourself accordingly the steps to complete consecration are few and simple you cannot be ruled from below if you are to be great you must rule from above therefore you cannot be governed by physical impulses you must bring your body into subjection to the mind but your mind without principle may lead you into selfishness and immoral ways you must put the mind into subjection to the soul and your soul is limited by the boundaries of your knowledge you must put it into subjection to that our soul which needs no searching of the understanding but before whose eye all things are spread that constitutes consecration say i surrender my body to be ruled by my mind i surrender my mind to be governed by my soul and i surrender my soul to the guidance of god make this consecration complete and thorough and you have taken the second great step in the way of greatness and power End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of the Science of Being Great」by Wallace G. Wattles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Identification Having recognized God as the advancing presence in nature, society, and your fellow man, and harmonized yourself with all these, and having consecrated yourself to that within you which impels you toward the greatest and the highest, the next step is to become aware of and recognize fully the fact that the principle of power within you is God himself. You must consciously identify yourself with the highest. This is not some false or untrue position to be assumed. It is a fact to be recognized. You are already one with God. You want to become consciously aware of it. There is one substance, the source of all things, and this substance has within itself the power that creates all things. All power is inherent in it. This substance is conscious and thinks. It works with perfect understanding and intelligence. You know that it is so, because you know that substance exists, and that consciousness exists, and that it must be substance that is conscious. Man is conscious and thinks. Man is substance. He must be substance, as he is nothing and does not exist at all. If man is substance and thinks, and is conscious, then he is conscious substance. It is not conceivable that there should be more than one conscious substance. So man is the original substance, the source of all life and power embodied in a physical form. 
man cannot be something different from god intelligence is one and the same everywhere and must be everywhere an attribute of the same substance there cannot be one kind of intelligence in god and another kind of intelligence in man intelligence can only be an intelligent substance and intelligent substance is god man is of one and the same stuff with god and so all the talents powers and possibilities that are in god are in man not just in a few exceptional men but in every one all power is given to man in heaven and on earth is it not written ye are gods the principle of power in man is man himself and man himself is god but while man is original substance and has within him all power and possibilities his consciousness is limited he does not know all there is to know and so he is liable to error and mistake to save himself from these he must unite his mind to that outside him which does know all he must become consciously one with god there is a mind surrounding him on every side closer than breathing nearer than hands and feet and in this mind is the memory of all that has ever happened from the greatest convulsions of nature in prehistoric days to the fall of a sparrow in this present time and all that is in existence now as well held in this mind is the great purpose that is behind all nature so it knows what is going to be man is surrounded by a mind that knows all there is to know past present and to come everything that man have said or done or written is present there man is of the same one identical stuff with this mind he proceeded from it and he can so identify himself with it that he may know what it knows my father is greater than i said jesus i come from him i and my father are one he shows the son all things the spirit shall guide you into all truth your identification of yourself with the infinite must be accomplished by conscious recognition on your part recognizing it as a fact that there is only god and that all intelligence is in the one substance you must affirm some what after this wise there is only one and that one is everywhere i surrender myself to conscious unity with the highest not i but the father i will to be one with the supreme and to lead the divine life i am one with infinite consciousness there is but one mind and i am that mind i that speak unto you am he if you have been thorough in the work as outlined in the preceding chapters if you have attained to the true viewpoint and if your consecration is complete you will not find conscious identification hard to attain and once it is attained the power you seek is yours for you have made yourself one with all the power there is end of chapter nine chapter ten of the science of being great by wallace d wattles this LibriVox recording is in the public domain idealization you are a thinking center in original substance and the thoughts of original substance have creative power whatever is formed in its thought and held as a thought form must come into existence as a visible and so-called material form and a thought form held in thinking substance is a reality it is a real thing whether it has yet become visible to mortal eye or not this is a fact that you should impress upon your understanding that a thought held in thinking substance is a real thing a form and has actual existence although it is not visible to you you internally take the form in which you think of yourself and you surround yourself with the invisible forms of those things with which you associate in your thoughts if you desire a thing picture it clearly and hold the picture steadily in mind until it becomes a definite thought form and if your practices are not such as to separate you from god the thing you want will come to you in material form it must do so in obedience to the law by which the universe was created make no thought form of yourself in connection with disease or sickness but form a conception of health make a thought form of yourself as strong and hearty and perfectly well impress this thought form on creative intelligence and if your practices are not in violation of the laws by which the physical body is built your thought form will become manifest in your flesh this also is certain 
it comes by obedience to law make a thought form of yourself as you desire to be and set your ideal as near to perfection as your imagination is capable of forming the conception let me illustrate if a young law student wishes to become great let him picture himself while attending to the viewpoint consecration and identification as previously directed as a great lawyer pleading his case with matchless eloquence and power before the judge and jury as having an unlimited command of truth of knowledge and of wisdom let him picture himself as the great lawyer in every possible situation and contingency while he is still only the student in all circumstances let him never forget or fail to be the great lawyer in his thought form of himself as the thought form grows more definite and habitual in his mind the creative energies both within and without are set at work he begins to manifest the form from within and all the essentials without which go into the picture begin to be impelled toward him he makes himself into the image and god works with him nothing can prevent him from becoming what he wishes to be in the same general way the musical student pictures himself as performing perfect harmonies and as delighting vast audiences the actor forms the highest conception he is capable of in regard to his art and applies this conception to himself the farmer and the mechanic do exactly the same thing fix upon your ideal of what you wish to make of yourself consider well and be sure that you make the right choice that is the one that will be the most satisfactory to you in a general way do not pay too much attention to the advice and suggestions of those around you do not believe that any one can know better than yourself what is right for you listen to what others have to say but always form your own conclusions do not let other people decide what you are to be be what you feel that you want to be do not be misled by a false notion of obligation or duty you can owe no possible obligation or duty to others that should prevent you from making the most of yourself be true to yourself and you cannot then be false to any man when you have fully decided what thing you want to be form the highest conception of that thing that you are capable of imagining and make that conception a thought form hold that thought form as a fact as the real truth about yourself and believe in it close your ears to all adverse suggestions never mind if people call you a fool or a dreamer dream on remember that bonaparte the half-starred lieutenant always saw himself as the general of armies and the master of france and he became in outward realization what he held himself to be in mind so likewise will you attend carefully to all that has been said in the preceding chapters and act as directed in the following ones and you will become what you want to be end of chapter 10